next on Unsolved Mysteries. In a story featuring Matthew McConaughey, a Texas killer on the lam leads police on a wild chase. A woman disappears, and then police find hundreds of bone fragments in her backyard. Meet Pierre. He has no idea who he is or where he is. He is a man without a memory. They're big, they're unexpected, and they usually prove to be hoaxes. But these crop circles seem to have no earthly explanation. You know, you could have the one vital clue to help solve one of our cases. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Bryan, Texas is small and quiet. Not the type of place where you'd expect a run-in with a cold-blooded killer. But as a woman we call Sue can tell you, it never hurts to be prepared. Well, it started like any other morning. My husband was leaving for work. My husband left and I went back into the bathroom in the master bedroom to finish getting dressed. I was standing there, looking in the mirror, finishing up my hair and I picked up the makeup mirror. And I looked and he had a large hunting knife. Instinct took over. Sue went on the attack. When she grabbed her gun, he took off running. It was very quick, and I don't think he was expecting me to do that. I think he probably was expecting me to plead with him not to do anything, and I reversed the situation on him. Sue had seen the man up close, but authorities were unable to identify him. She and her husband tried to put the incident behind them. Then four months later, Sue got another look at the attacker. I was going through the newspaper, and I opened it up, and his picture was in the newspaper. That's the guy. What? That's the guy, honey. This and is I was guy. just shocked to have found out what he had done. That's him right there. The newspaper listed the state's most wanted criminals. And right at the top was the knife-wielding intruder. His name? was Edward Harold Bell. Edward Harold Bell had a rap sheet a mile long. Highlighted by aggravated rape and several counts of indecent exposure to children. Sue also learned that Bell was wanted for murder. Pasadena, Texas. 26-year-old Larry Dickens grew up in Pasadena with his mother and his sister. Larry was an ex-Marine, a youth counselor, and the father of a three-year-old girl. He was home for a few days, and he was cutting our lawn for us. I was standing at the kitchen window, and there were a lot of children playing in the intersection right by our house. I saw this pickup truck drive up. He parked and he got out of his truck and he was nude from his waist down. The Pasadena police, real quick, please. You, you've got. As Dorothy uh, phoned the police, the Larry corner. came He's into the kitchen. Exposing himself. Oh, what, honey? Honey, look at that man out there. Look what he is doing, Larry. Larry went out to confront the flasher. His mother, still on the phone, watched from the kitchen window. 
Oh, my son has gone out there. He's taking the keys. He's trying to detain him. Oh, the guy's come back. He's putting his pants on now. I don't know. I hear him arguing. I don't know what they're saying. I, I don't know. Oh, my God, he's got a gun. Oh, God, he's got a gun. He just shot it in the air. He's shooting Larry. I see blood. He's shooting Larry. Larry! 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 No! Tell him to give me the keys! Give him the keys. Tell him to give me the keys. I believe I call the police. The police. You go. You go. And I said, please don't shoot him. just shot him anyway and then he turned and started running out of our garage and Larry even with all those bullets in him was still trying to stop this man he had been shot four times in the chest and once in the head with a 22 caliber pistol Larry's mother rushed back to the phone the emergency operator was still on the line Police units and an ambulance were already on the way. Get me an ambulance. Oh, oh God, he's got a rifle. He's got, he's got. <laughs> At that same moment, Larry's 17-year-old sister, Donna, drove up the street. I pulled up to the stop sign and I saw a man cross the street to the edge of my driveway. And I looked and I got a good close look at the man, and I tried to block his exit. And I realized he had just shot my brother. Larry! <laughs> I just started screaming, and I just screamed and screamed. And then when I couldn't scream anymore, I remember I just went over and I knelt down beside my brother, and I watched him die. <laughs> Police units nearing the scene recognized the suspect's truck and immediately went after him. Edward Bell was ready to kill again, but his M1 rifle suddenly jammed. Put your hands up! Don't move! Drop the gun! Back away! Back away from it! Within 20 minutes of the murder, Bell was headed straight back to the crime scene so that Larry's family could identify him. They opened the back door of the police car so that I could see him better. Yeah, that's him! Oh, I hate you! Oh, I hate you! Why did you come? I just wanted to get my hands on him. I hate you! It hurts me so bad that he killed my brother. There's always going to be an emptiness. It's never going to be reunited. I mean, part of me is missing. Incredibly, Edward Bell was released on bail. He promptly cashed in $140,000 of assets and disappeared. He's not leaving a paper trail. Probably he's changed his name and he's living somewhere where someone doesn't know how dangerous he is. It just doesn't seem right that this man can be back on the streets when Larry has been dead all these years, and he's still at large. Update. When this story aired, at least two viewers recognized Edward Bell. 
once said he recently met Bell during a business trip to Panama City, Panama. The other viewer sent these pictures and a letter claiming that Bell had lived in Panama for several years. He was prospecting for gold on land near Panama City. The Panama police were able to locate Mr. Bell, at which time they placed him under arrest, and uh, the FBI, along with the Panama City Police Department, then brought Mr. Bell back to the United States. Larry's mother and sister were at the airport when Bell arrived. Finally, a decade and a half after Dorothy Lang's son had been gunned down before her eyes, his accused killer shuffled past her, shackled in hand and leg cuffs. When he got off the airplane, he seemed so arrogant, and it just infuriated me. Here they're bringing this murderer back, and they could never bring back my son. The wounds will never heal. The hurt will always be there that I've lost my brother. But at least justice will be done, and I think we'll all be able to go on with our lives. Edward Harold Bell was convicted of murder and sentenced to 70 years in prison. He has since been named as a person of interest in the murders of six young girls in the Galveston, Texas area. Bell will be eligible for parole in the year 2013. Next, a woman disappears, but she may never have left her backyard. What happened to Monica Rizzo? And later, amnesia. A man hits the road with only $17 and little idea who he is or where he's going. San Antonio, Texas. When 44-year-old Monica Rizzo left her office, she didn't take her purse, she didn't even say goodbye. She just walked out the door and never returned. Monica's husband, Leonard, claims she came home that afternoon. He says a few days later, when he woke up in the morning, she was gone. But he never reported her disappearance to the police. I was very confused. It made no sense. My wife and I were very close. There was no reason for me to believe she wouldn't be coming back wherever she'd gone. Uh, I just, I, I have faith in her. I just chose to wait. Hello, can I help you? Is this the San Antonio police? Yes, it is. I'd like to report a murder. Okay. A woman, Monica Rizzo, was murdered. It sounded like a gruesome prank. The anonymous caller said that Monica Rizzo had been murdered by her husband and that there were bones in her backyard to prove it. The San Antonio police wasted no time. At the Rizzo house, Monica's oldest son answered the door. He told the police that he was just visiting and that he hadn't seen his mother in a week. You know when she's expected back? No. You mind if we have a look around? No, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Monica's clothes still hung in the closet. Her car was parked in the driveway. Nothing seemed to be missing except Monica Rizzo. In the backyard, detectives did find bones, but they clearly belonged to some kind of an animal. The anonymous caller appeared to be wrong. Hello. You need to go back and search their house again. Leonard Rizzo killed his wife. The bones are in the backyard. They're under a pile of tires by the fence. Again, the police responded out there, uh, along with some homicide detectives that went out there and took a look and they did find some, what appeared to be human bones. Detectives collected a skull, a number of bone fragments, and even a bag filled with what appeared to be human flesh. Tom, take a look at this. Leonard Rizzo had some explaining to do. The center of my yard are an absolute mystery to me, as, as big a mystery as my wife's disappearance. Uh, to me, there's, to me, there's no question. To me, I'm, someone is trying to draw attention from themselves. Someone is doing this to me. Detectives learned that on another occasion, 
Monica's co-workers had been so worried when she didn't show up for work that they asked the police to check on her at home. Yeah. Are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. It looks like there's some bruising on your face. No, I just fell. I I'm fine. You sure you're okay? Yes. There was no domestic abuse. There was no domestic violence. My wife and I were deeply in love. We are deeply in love. Initial DNA tests on the bones in the Rizzo's backyard proved they were human. But whose bones were they? Police brought in a team of archaeologists from the University of Texas. We literally crawled across this area using our trowels and moving the roots and the moving the grass blades and looking down beneath the grass. And every time we found a bone fragment or something the police department considered might be evidence, we'd put an orange pin flag out. Before they were done, the yard was dotted with dozens of orange flags. When you find bone in an old archaeological site, the bone is very dry. This bone still had a greasy feel to it. So we knew it had not been there uh, very long, but at the same time, it had been there more than a week or a couple weeks. There was no soft tissue still attached to it. There were bones everywhere, even inside the barbecue grill. I picked it up and looked at it, and I was sure it was a human hand bone because it has a, a distinctive shape, although it's very small, maybe a half an inch or so. What do you got? The archaeologists found even more bones in the barbecue, all of them from human hands. Sure. Found For eight days, Dr. Hart and his team collected bone fragments, 200 in all. Most had been chopped into pieces less than three inches long. We felt it was some kind of machine, uh, some type of chipper shredder has been discussed quite a bit. It's the only machine that we can come up with that could possibly account for this type of breakage. You wouldn't get it with a saw, you wouldn't get it with a knife, you wouldn't get it with a, a lawnmower. We, we can't think of anything else that would break up bone like this. Once again, Leonard Rizzo had some explaining to do. I've never even operated a wood chipper. I've never running, rented anything in a rental store uh, other than a car dolly, uh, maybe a trailer. Uh, no, I do not, did not operate a wood chipper. I never have. The lack of a conclusive DNA test or other hard evidence meant that no arrests could be made. Leonard Rizzo continued to insist that he had nothing to do with his wife's disappearance or the bones in his backyard. Those bone fragments and such, where they came from, I don't know how they got there. I don't know, and I adamantly did not kill them or anyone else. Update. For two years, there were no new developments in this case. Then Leonard Rizzo was arrested for attacking his girlfriend. He was convicted on four criminal counts, including assault with a deadly weapon and kidnapping. Later, DNA tests revealed that all the bone fragments were in fact those of Monica Rizzo. But the district attorney still lacks enough evidence to file charges. If you have any information about the murder of Monica Rizzo, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, imagine waking up with no sense of who you are, where you are, or where you come from. That's exactly what happened to this young man. And later, bizarre crop circles in Canada. A hoax or a mystery beyond earthly explanation. <laughs> Highway 1 in the picturesque Big Sur area of California. A chilly, windswept morning along a deserted stretch of coastline. A man awoke, alone and disoriented, a blue duffel bag beside him. Weak and hungry, he makes his way to the top of the bluff. He finds a road, Highway 1. He spots a nearby telephone. He knows what to do. That much he remembers. Only then, does it dawn on him, he has no one to call. Then I realized I couldn't phone anybody. And that's when 
I realized I didn't know anybody, including me. Those first few minutes, you're literally nothing, and you feel so empty. It's very lonely and painful to be empty. Searching his duffel bag, he found a single clue tucked in his shirt pocket. A library card from the Boston Public Library. Handwritten on the back was a name. April Pierre. It struck me that must be me. It's in my belongings, it's with my socks, it's with my shirts, it's with my things. The name brought back hazy memories of San Diego, California, 400 miles away. Pierre only had $17. He would have to hitchhike. Three days later, Pierre was wandering the streets of San Diego, searching for something, anything, that might tell him who he was. I was so sure this city would bring everything back. But I saw downtown and said nothing. I looked at the building and they meant nothing. And uh, I walked the streets of the city for a long time. Fearing for his sanity, Pierre took refuge at the St. Vincent de Paul homeless shelter. We've had cases of people pretending they didn't know who they were. But Pierre was very unique. Sometimes in, in the other cases, the residents are after something, and that wasn't Pierre's case at all. He didn't ask for anything. He didn't even ask for help. After six months of physical and psychological examinations, doctors could find no cause for Pierre's memory loss. Their best guess? He was suffering from trauma-induced amnesia. While at St. Vincent's, Pierre concentrated on reviving his lost memory. And soon, fragments of his former self began to emerge. Pierre apparently knew a lot about physics, advanced math, and computers. He even became convinced that he could fly an airplane. Pierre also found that he had a talent for music and learned to play the guitar in just a few hours. To help Pierre make sense of his fragmented memories, we set up a meeting with a police sketch artist. Two portraits were created, portraits of people who may have been significant in Pierre's past. Pierre believed the first was his cousin, Luke, nicknamed Curly. The second drawing showed a woman Pierre recalled working with. He thought her name might be Carol. If I try to remember something too hard, I get a beautiful headache that I wouldn't want to inflict on my worst enemy. And most recently, like those last few days, if I try not to remember something that's coming back, I get the same thing. I, I just want to find out what the past is if I can. Update. On the night of our broadcast, the woman Pierre called Carol recognized him as a former employee. She confirmed that his name is in fact Pierre April. Carol contacted Pierre and told him that he has two sisters and that his parents live in Lachine, Canada, where his father practices medicine. The next day, Pierre talked to his dad for the first time in more than five months. It was a very emotional moment. And, and then I even had to tell him that I couldn't even trust him 100%, that I, I wanted the package with family pictures in it and with my birth certificate in it. When the package arrived, Pierre and his fiance, a woman he met in San Diego, sat down with a friend to get a first look at Pierre's long lost past. It is strange to be told who you are and what you did. I'm someone again. And for quite a few months, I was nobody and nothing. Thanks to our audience, Pierre April has recovered his memory of his past and his life. Coming up, strange lights and bizarre formations. Are they connected to forces that we can't explain. But next, a case with all the trademarks of an organized hit, except a body.
On a recent broadcast, we profiled the disturbing case of Wendy Long. Bye, Mom. Hi, sweetie. She left her home in Cushada, Louisiana for a weekend in Shreveport and never came back. On the way to Shreveport, Wendy picked up two friends for an afternoon of shopping. Later, the trio hooked up with a young man known only as Tommy. That night, they all hit a party at another friend's house. And I'm told that Wendy would had quite a bit to drink that night. When it came time for them to take Tommy back home, she didn't want to drive. In fact, she didn't want to go with them at all. Tommy later claimed that he was worried about Wendy. So he went back to the party in his own car. Wendy then accepted his offer of a ride home. On the way, Tommy said, he stopped for gas and a quart of oil. When he came back out, Wendy was talking to two young men in a black Chevy truck. Hey, Tommy, come here. This is Mike and Zant. Tommy said that it appeared that she knew them. And Wendy told Tommy at that point not to worry about it, that she was going to go with them and they were going to get her home. I will get home OK. Just go home. According to Tommy, Wendy left with the two men. Tommy says he never saw her again. When police questioned Tommy about that night, he agreed to take a lie detector test. He passed. Tommy even gave a detailed description of the two men. The police investigated and found nothing but dead ends. Update. Five months after Wendy's disappearance, Tommy, whose real name was Robert Stewart, was arrested for check fraud. That was enough for the police to take another look at his connection to Wendy Long. I think in just looking at him as a possible suspect instead of a possible witness, they started pointing out inconsistencies in his story. Stewart's story wasn't just inconsistent. This is Mike and Zant. It was a total lie. When the information continued to turn up false and the story broke down, Mr. Stewart began to break down. He then confessed to raping Wendy Long and murdering her by shooting her twice in the head. During one of the subsequent interviews, Mr. Stewart gave investigators the location of the body. Investigators went to that location and found uh, what appeared to be human remains. Those remains ultimately were determined to be the remains of Wendy Long. Robert Stewart pled guilty to the rape and first degree murder of Wendy Long. He is now in the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola where he will most likely spend the rest of his life. The barren, lifeless desert of southern Arizona. If someone wanted to commit a crime or maybe cover one up, there are few better places than the middle of this desert, 100 miles south of Phoenix. It's unlikely anyone will ever discover what happened here. But perhaps someone watching tonight can provide a clue. The car was still on fire when a deputy sheriff arrived. Authorities believe that whoever set the fire was interested in destroying evidence, evidence of a much bigger crime, murder. The car was burned to the ground. And the fact is that had there been any evidence in the car, such as blood, uh, we weren't able to tell because of the, the burning. The car belonged to a 56-year-old bank executive, Lee Young. Lee's job was to investigate possible fraud cases against his bank in Scottsdale. When they gave me the information the car was burned and Lee wasn't there, then my wildest fears just became a reality. Because you live with that every day, that something could happen, but you just don't really believe it ever will. Had Lee Young been murdered and his body dumped in the desert? There was an obvious motive. 
Young always wore a very distinctive and very expensive Rolex watch. Plus, he always carried large amounts of cash to buy jewelry, which he sold in his spare time. When police opened Lee's trunk, they were in for a big surprise. It was jewelry worth thousands of dollars. His Rolex watch had been taken, but why was the rest of the jewelry left behind? Okay, you want to get another one? The only thing missing out of that trunk of that car that I am aware of is the briefcase that carried his files. So that makes me believe that it wasn't robbery motive, it was case related of some sort. The robbery theory lost steam, but another motive took its place. Hold my calls. Lee Young had recently contacted federal drug agents. He suspected that his bank was being used by a money laundering ring. Our sources in New York have traced it from South America. Lee was investigating a major drug cartel in Colombia within six months prior to his disappearance, and the case was still ongoing, as a matter of fact, at the time of his disappearance. Police pieced together Young's movements before he disappeared. He left a restaurant in Scottsdale at around 12.30 p.m. He was never seen again. However, Lee or someone else did use his car phone later that afternoon. A single call came in over Young's car phone, and three calls were dialed out. One went to a phone booth, the others to a woman who denied ever talking to Lee on the phone. I don't know for a fact that Lee made these calls. In fact, it's possible that Lee was taken down prior to 2 o'clock Friday afternoon and that uh, the three calls made after 2 o'clock were made by uh, somebody else. Everything points to the fact that Lee's not alive. My heart still says he's out there somewhere. But logic tells me he's not. Critical information is still missing in this case. Who made the phone calls? Who torched the car? Did Lee die in a robbery gone wrong? Or did his investigation into a money laundering operation for a drug cartel get him killed? Connie Young hopes that someone saw her husband's plum-colored Lincoln Town car. Between the time he left the restaurant and the time the car was found in flames the next day. She also hopes someone might have seen his copper-faced Rolex watch. It has diamonds encircling the face and on the band. If you have any information about what happened to Lee Young, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, it's a mystery that just keeps showing up. The crop circle invasion of Western Canada. These days, almost everyone knows about crop circles, geometric designs that seem to appear out of nowhere. Of the 10,000 documented cases, 80% are proven hoaxes. And the other 20%? Well, that's when it gets interesting. The Canadian prairie outside of Edmonton, Alberta. The farmers you'll find here are about as down to earth as anyone. It takes a lot to surprise folks like Rusty Manuel and Telly Whitman. Hey. But this formation that showed up on their land was enough to do the trick. The grain was all flattened down and it almost looked like a pattern like petals, the way the grain came out and then the heads turned back in towards the center again. It was just amazing. It was just like you see on television. Seven precise circles pressed into a field of thistle and barley. I got a hold of the city police, and the city police did come out. Uh, he was totally amazed. The Canadian Crop Circle Research Network, a volunteer organization that documents these cases, wasted no time getting to the site. Judy Arndt is one of the group's field researchers. It looked like a place had been electrocuted. It was just amazing. Looked like there had been a huge force of some sort. Skeptics were quick to dismiss the whole affair as a hoax, as once shown in a documentary. 
pranksters could be seen making a crop circle. They call their creations human land art. It was very clear to us that it hadn't been flattened by somebody out there with planks and boards. You can't do that to thistle. It was very densely grown, and it would be very difficult for anybody to get in without leaving tracks behind. Paul Anderson, director of the CCCRN, has studied many of the circles in Western Canada. Well, anybody can go up with a board and flatten down wheat. And yes, something you have to take into account is it's not just the formation itself, but it's the complexity of how it's actually constructed. Like multiple layers going in different directions, one on top of the other, and so on. At the Edmonton site, Judy Arndt carefully documented each of the circles within the formation. She also gathered up crop and soil samples for scientific analysis. The samples were sent to Nancy Talbot in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Nancy works with a network of scientists who have studied more than 350 crop circle cases from eight different countries. The three major changes in plants and the real McCoy as opposed to man-made crop circles are node elongation, expulsion cavities at the nodes, and germination abnormalities. Each of these conditions was present in the Edmonton sample. In other words, the characteristics of the crops were profoundly altered in ways that could not be induced by humans using ropes and boards. The geometry is precise. There are no tracks in or out. The plants are not damaged. They're bent over. They're not knuckled or broken. The plants are changed in their internal structure at the cellular level. You don't find that in the hoax. The soil samples from Edmonton were sent to Dr. Sandpath Iyengar in California. Dr. Iyengar specializes in materials analysis. We went ahead and looked at the mineralogy of the clays using a technique called X-ray powder diffraction. The results showed a dramatic difference between soil samples taken from inside the crop circle compared to those taken from outside the circle. This has been seen by geologists before, but in a geologic time over several millions of years, this has to be some kind of fantastic energy that's causing this change. And I don't have any idea what it is. There are almost as many theories as there are circles, everything from geothermal and magnetic forces to some kind of cosmic energy. We looked at meteorology, we looked at earth energies, we looked at chemical application of the farmers, and all of them led to a blank. It just did not fit. What we now know is we have a solid mystery. This cannot be explained uh, in the terms of people making them. We have many hundreds that are absolutely, certainly not man-made. And, and that is a, a, a solid fact. There is one final theory. If it can't be explained here on Earth, then look to the sky. I was contacted by a young couple who had been driving uh, along in the late evening in North Edmonton. And he looked out the window and saw some lights and rolled down the window to make sure it wasn't just reflection on his passenger side window. What is that? And the lights were still there. He got quite excited about it and asked his wife to pull over. There were two small lights, brilliant bluish, and they said these two lights looked like they were playing tag with each other. This sighting occurred about a week before the uh, crop circle formation was found. Around that same time, Rusty Manuel and Telly Whitman had a light show of their own. What's that? What? First you thought it was a helicopter, because it moved like a helicopter, but still there was no other lights on it. It was just fright, and would just hover over the field and sort of move off and then come back again. I've never seen it like that. I tried to picture it as being an aircraft, but it, it was too much too big for an aircraft. That's no airplane. And it just no. seemed like it passed over the back end of the pickup, and it just, it just disappeared. It just was so fast. Was there a connection between the strange lights 
and the sudden appearance of the Edmonton Craft Circus. We took that question to Seth Shostak, senior astronomer at the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. I believe that the aliens are out there, but I don't think that they're visiting here. The fact that so many people feel that there may be something unusual going on here. I think this speaks a psychological need that we all have to, to believe that there are some powers that we don't understand. And after all, it's much more interesting to think that this pattern in the weed here was graffiti from beings from another world than to think that it was students from the local university. That's not a terribly interesting story. But there are crop circles that simply defy logic, formations that show no sign of human intervention. This giant star of David literally appeared overnight in Red Deer, Alberta, not far from Edmonton. It measured an incredible 422 feet across. Impressive? Absolutely. But for Seth Shostak, it's still nothing more than smoke and mirrors. I don't understand how they're all done. But to say that they are made by something other than humans is a radical, a revolutionary claim. And consequently, I'm not going to be swayed by what amounts to very anecdotal evidence. It's got to be better than that. I don't think we need necessarily to be talking or trying to prove that it is or isn't extraterrestrial. I don't know that either. What I know is what I'm looking at that has arrived in our fields. Something knows what it's doing here. There is intelligence of some sort. And I know they're not all made by people. Over the past decades, more than 10,000 crop circles have been reported from around the world. Assuming that 8,000 were made by pranksters, that still leaves 2,000 of these strange formations that are unexplained, which makes them an unsolved mystery. If you have any information on the cases presented tonight, log on to unsolved.com.